Chapter 25. The TV Crew I went downstairs. I would worked out what Cat had worked out and I was glad, but now I needed to think some more. What was the next thing to do? The police were in the kitchen. The door was open. I did some more eavesdropping and heard Despe Detective Inspector Pierce saying, It could have been anyone phoning Gloria, not necessarily saving, anyone who had found or borrowed his phone. And then another officer, police officer. Sometimes mobile phones ring a number off their own accord, when the keypad's not locked. It wasn't very interesting, and while the grown-up's attention was diverted, I decided it was a good time to take action. I crept into the living room and picked up the phone. One thing I know about, because Mum has shown me, is getting an unknown number through directory inquiries. The six numbers to dial are in my head. I dialed them and a man answered. Frontline security, I said. London. He put me through to an automatic voice, which gave me an 11-digit number. I memorised it. I hung up and dialed the number. There was music playing and then a recorded message. Welcome to Frontline Security, the number one London security company. We supply stewards, ticket collectors, body searchers and guards with two-way radios. Whether you're hosting a celebrity party, a fireworks show, a popular concert or an exhibition, we can meet all of your requirements. Frontline Security, your complete security solution. Please hold while we put you through to an operator. The music started again. My free hand flapped. I was still waiting for the operator when Rashid came in. I wondered if I should put down the phone, but he smiled at me and said nothing. He fetched his jacket from the back of the armchair and left the room. I was still on hold. The recorded announcement went round another time, then another. Halfway through the fourth time, there was a click and a real woman's voice saying, Hello, frontline security, can I help you? Hmm... I said, hello, the woman said again. I didn't know what to say. Hello. My mind spun like the vortex of a tropical cyclone. Hello, is anybody there? Frontline security. I hung up. Just as I did so, I heard a big van draw up outside. Doors slammed, voices shouted and the doorbell rang. I looked out the window. A television crew had arrived. Aunt Gloria and Rashid had decided to go public. Within minutes, the house was full of men in jeans and trainers. Carrying cameras, cables, light stands, microphones. The living room was very busy indeed. Sometimes when Dad asked Mum how work was, she said the ward was like Piccadilly Circus. I imagined flashing lights and people bumping into each other and drug top trolleys zooming around like fast cars. And that's how it was in our living room now. Nobody noticed me standing by the telephone. Detective Inspector, Inspector Pierce talked on her mobile. Aunt Gloria searched her makeup bag. Mum helped a cameraman plug a camera light into the socket behind the sofa. She looked up and saw me. Ted, there you are. Where's Cat? My mouth opened but no words came out. Instead, the cameraman said, Pass the plug over, love. And Mum was distracted. Seconds later, a man with a thin, frowning face said, Let's roll. But instead of rolling, another man said, Lights, camera, action, take one. Aunt Gloria sat on the sofa. Rashid sat next to her. She'd put on some bright orange lipstick and this made her face look whiter than usual and the skin between her eyelashes and eyebrows looked bruised. This is a message, she began. She swallowed, took Rashid's hand. A message. If you are holding Salem, if you know where my boy is, if you think you might have seen him, please, please come forward. We'll do anything to have him back. He's our boy. Just a call to let us know he's safe, to let us know he's alive. Her face crumpled. The worry, worry is crippling us. Please, call the police. Thank you. Cut, the thin-faced man said to the cameraman. That was great, missus, he said to Aunt Gloria. Do you want me to do it again? Aunt Gloria said. Do you want another take? No need, love. Are you sure? First fine, first time, you were natural. And within minutes, the camera crew had packed up and left. Mum and Rashid saw them out to their van and the police left at the same time. This meant I was on my own, in a room with Aunt Gloria. She sat on the sofa, staring into space. Oh, Ted, she said after a minute of silence. She was looking straight at me and I couldn't understand what her expression meant. I thought she was going to say something cross. But instead she shook her head and her eyes watered. Did I do all right? She whispered. Yes, Aunt Gloria, I said. Do you think somebody out there might hurt here? They might help? It's a possibility, I said. What do you think, Ted? Do you think Salem is right? Hmm, I said. What does that mean? Her face took on its mini Ice Age look. I was just thinking, Aunt Gloria. The mini Ice Age thawed. She sighed. Her hands went out and landed on my head. She ruffled up my hair the way that my mum does. I squirmed. Aunt Gloria didn't notice. You know, Ted, I'm sick to my stomach. I stared at her stomach in confusion. At least you're honest, she said. Everyone keeps telling me he's okay. 
They're sure he's fine. It will all work out. He'll be back any minute. But minute after minute goes by and he isn't back. They don't mean what they say. The truth is we just don't know. Aunt Gloria, I said. Salem has to be somewhere. It's a mystery. I'm working on it. In my brain. Your brain? Aunt Gloria repeated. She smiled at me. It reminded me of the way my mum smiled at me the time I asked her about miracle cures and whether I could get one for my syndrome if I prayed hard enough. Like mum's then, Aunt Gloria's lips turned up, but the way, but at the same time a tear came down her cheek. She shook my hand and rubbed my knuckles, which was a strange thing to do, and I started my other hand flapping. Sometimes I think there's more in that brain of yours, Ted, than the rest of ours put together. If our brains could bring Salem back, yours would do it. Then Aunt Gloria got up from the sofa and went upstairs to Cat's room, which was where she was sleeping. I didn't want to run into Mum's in case she asked me about Cat again, and I'd have to tell the Tiffany lie. So I went where I always go when I want to do my two favourite things. Think and watch the weather. The back garden. The shirts were still flapping on the line. They'd been there for three days. Mum had forgotten about them. I touched them. They were damp from the light rain we'd had that morning. I paced the lawn to check it hadn't grown or shrunk. Twelve and a half strides wide and seven across, the same as last week. Then I realised that when I grew taller and my legs longer, the number of strides would decrease. It was another example of think things can change, depending on how you look at them. I was back with the water going down the plug hole in different direction, depending on which hemisphere you were in. The London Eye revolving in different direction, depending on which side of the river you were on. Worms being male or female. Satellites moving and staying still. Something flickered in my brain. It was a pattern. Two things that looked alike. Something that looked like one thing, but there was really another thing. I pinched my right, or my right forearm to make the pattern stay, but it didn't. It vanished before I could fix it, before I could find out what it was. I looked up at the sky, thin strata cloud, white and harmless, floated in the southeast. But to the 200 northwest, in the heart of the city, a cumulus cloud was in formation. I stared as vapour collected and imagined the particles of water were swirling round a central funnel, making it a threatening shaft. It might or might not bring rain. It was moving this way over the skyline. Its heavy, bulbous shape billowed out as our rising air currents added to, it, added to its mass. I thought of Cat out there, somewhere in the city, under the growing cumulus clouds on the trail of the strange man who sold us the ticket. And I knew what I had to do. I got to the phone in Mum and Dad's bedroom with nobody noticing. I dialed Frontline Security again. Frontline Security! Came the same female voice after the music and the recorded announcement. Hello? I said. Hello, she said. Can I help you? Hmm. I said. Sorry, she said. Didn't catch that. Uh, I said. You're just a kid, aren't you? I'm 12 years old, I said. Well, she said. I'm just a temp. There was a silence. I thought hard. Have you got the right number? She asked. Yes. So who are you looking for? A man, I said. A man? A man with a stubbly chin. She laughed loudly. Sounds like Christy. He's the only one here who never shaves properly. You're the second person who's been after him today. I'll tell you what I told her. He's not here. Not here? I'm the only one here today. Oh, I'm manning the phone. So to speak, she laughed more down the phone. I didn't understand the joke, but I did what Mr Shepherd told me to do and laughed as well. First, it's a young girl looking for the friend of her older brother. She's got a picture of him and she doesn't know what he's called and she's desperate because he's left his asthma inhaler in his house. Now it's a kid looking for a man with a stubby chin. Well, honey, I'll tell you what I told the girl. It's no skin off my teeth. I pictured the pink flesh around her molars. Christie's with the other guys and gals. They're all on the same job this week, down Earl's Court at the motorcycle and scooter show. Earl's Court? The big exhibition hall. If you find Christie there, don't say I told you, will you? No, I said, but she'd already hung up. You can live for a whole life, 12 years and 188 days, or... 4,571 days, not forgetting the three extra days for leap years, and not tell a single lie. Then, on day 4,572, you tell two. The first lie I told was about the lost compass that wasn't really lost. The second lie was the note I wrote and left by the phone. It said, Dear Mum, we have gone swimming to get some exercise. Ted, next I took 15 one pound coins from the treasure chest that I've had since I was five. I went to the kitchen on the landing and listened. Mum and Rashid were downstairs in the kitchen. They were talking quietly. The house was calm. I crept down the stairs. I headed for the front door. I opened it, stepped out of the sunshine and paused. Was this the right thing to do? What if Mum found the note and didn't believe it? 
What if I didn't find Cat in Isles Court Exhibition Centre? What if I didn't find Isles Court at all? What if I didn't even make it to our local underground station? But catastrophe, cataclysm, catalogue of disasters, my mean mad sister was going to leave me behind. Not when so much was at stake, I inched the door shut, I headed out through the postage stamp front garden, I closed the gate behind me and walked out onto the pavement and down the road.